I watched 100 mixing tips videos in a single day to see if there's anything that nobody on YouTube is talking about. For a alert, I did find something and it really surprised me that nobody was talking about it. What do you think it'll be? Leave a comment below. Okay, let's jump right in. So I'm just gonna search mixing tips. The first video is actually one of ours. Let's check it out. I mean, this is pretty old, three years ago. By the way, the reason I'm in this cheesy virtual studio is because uh, this is what my real studio looks like. Polish shit until it shines, but it's still shit. That's a pretty good tip. <laughs> You can polish shit until it shines, but it's still shit. However, you can roll a shit in glitter. I don't know what that means. Take from that what you will. So now we've reached the end of our list. Tip number 21. It's the most important tip. It's also the most obvious and the most overlooked. And that is that you need to practice, 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 and you need to listen. I mean, amen to that. I don't have anything to add there. Okay, cool. One down, 99 to go. Tip number one is to remove the sub bass frequencies in every instrument besides the kick and bass. Okay, that's interesting. And if you don't think there's any sub bass frequencies in that instrument, low frequency dirt. I mean, he has a point, I, I don't disagree. I guess my, my view on this is, if it's not causing a problem, don't fix it. So going through every single channel in your mix and applying a high pass filter probably will help. But at the end of the day, it's gonna take a lot of time and a lot of time you just don't need it. So I guess it would be safe to do it that way. If there's not a problem with the low end on a certain channel, then there's no reason to necessarily high pass it. Uh, but I guess better safe than sorry. It's an interesting place to start though. Tip number three is to EQ your reverb. Another great tip, so that could be expanded to EQ any aux channels or compress your aux channels or do whatever the fuck you want on your aux channel. For example, your reverb, or you could even have a, a vocal delay and instead of putting the vocal delay on the vocal channel itself, hit on an aux and now you can add some chorusing to it. You could add some reverb to the delay. You can EQ it. I love doing that kind of stuff. I love going crazy, especially with vocal effects and just making those delays sound really funky and vibey by adding chorusing, phasing, whatever you want. This is a video that I recorded four years ago. My views have probably changed quite a bit since this. I've learned a lot since this. It's going to be really interesting to see what's potentially changed since I recorded this video four years ago. Mixing tip number two is to get the balance right first. Yep, definitely still agree with this. I would even emphasize this even more and say that you should practice doing balance only mixes. Try and mix a track only using balancing, nothing else. Do that on a few tracks, export it, go and listen to it in your car or wherever else. Treat it like it's a real mix, but only use volume balancing. Trust me, it's, it'll be worth it. Mixing tip number eight is to have an intention behind every single move. Again, I'm actually gonna expand on this. I think saying have an intention is, is helpful because you should have an intention, but how do you know what that intention is? It's really easy to say, hey, you need to know exactly what you're gonna do before you do anything. Not really helpful, right? So I actually wanna chunk this down a little bit. Having an intention comes back to a few things. One is solving problems. So if there's not a problem in the mix, don't do anything. You wanna be reacting to what the mix is telling you it needs. You wanna be identifying problems and solving them, not just doing things for the sake of it or because you saw a video or a mix and tips video like this that told you to do it. And sometimes the problem is just that something sounds boring. So you can play around with effects sometimes. It doesn't necessarily have to be, oh, I need to fix this frequency or I need to fix this dynamic issue. It can sometimes be, hey, this sounds boring, let's spice it up a little bit. But that's still solving a problem. And another way you can think about intentionality is having references. Because if you compare your mix to your reference and there's clear gaps, that helps you identify problems. Another way is having taste and actually knowing what sound you wanna go for and having an idea of the kind of sound that you're going for in the entire production process before you even start. Because now, again, you have an end goal that you constantly measure against and that gives you your intention. And then four is you actually need good it. So you need to be able to listen to something and kind of have a rough idea of how you you're going to EQ it before you even reach for an EQ, for example. And the way you do that is you use tools like Sound Gym to train your ears. And then over time, you get really good at identifying frequency issues and you can just listen to something and say, okay, I need to cut 300 hertz. There's your intention, load up your EQ, do it. Rather than loading up an EQ and just playing around for a while and not really knowing what you're doing with it. That's really important. I want to make sure that you watch all the way till the end because I'm not going to just talk about why you should stop watching mixing tutorials. I'm also going to talk about what you should be doing instead. So here's what you should be focusing on great songwriting, making sure that your songs are compelling, having really good song structure, having good melody, chord progressions that are actually compelling and pro providing the emotion of the song, then we're ready to move into the producing stage. Arranging, that is the, the art or the craft or the skill set. So Nathan's absolutely right. He's saying, stop watching mixing tutorials. Instead, focus on the quality of your song, focus on the quality of your production. And that's 100% true. And I do think this is a problem with YouTube is that mixing tips, mixing tricks are sexy. They're 
they're easy to watch, they're fun to watch, and you end up with a bunch of kind of disparate, disconnected mixing tricks that don't actually help you, one, even mix properly, let alone produce to a high standard or write music to a high standard. And that's kind of why I wanted to make this video is to see, okay, what's missing? What are people not talking about? Or could you actually take all of these mixing tricks and tips and combine them to create kind of cohesive mixing philosophy and a framework for your own mixes? So far, I'm kind of agreeing with Nathan. It's just a bit all over the place. And focusing on mixing might not even be the right thing for you at this moment in time. Unless you've got a great song and unless it's produced really well, you don't really need to worry about mixing. Um, you know, I wanted a crescendo kind of feeling at the end of the thing, so uh, I just wrote the delay time and had a... So Bob's touching on something really important here, which is that mixing is dynamic. It's not static. It's not something where you just set the levels and it works for the whole song. You need to expect that once you've got kind of the loudest section or the final chorus sounding good, you're going to have to go back to the rest of the song and make changes because most instruments are too loud in some sections, too quiet in others. Or when it comes to effects, you want to have movement in the mix. You want to bring it to life. So you want to add automation to your effects. So that's a really easy way once you've got kind of the basics down. Again, you don't need to do anything complicated. Just volume automation alone is a game changer before you even get into effects. If you just went back through your whole mix and applied a little volume automation because, oh, okay, in this verse, this thing's standing out a little bit too much or, oh, here, actually the vocal drops out. So I'm going to turn up the guitar to fill that space. All of that, something as simple as volume, adding dynamic automation is just the thing that takes your mixes to that next level. And honestly, it's essential. I don't know how you could mix without it because most songs aren't completely completely the same the whole way through. If they are, that's gonna be a boring song. One of the things that I find helped me the most uh, in my mixing, and that's automation. Boom, there you go, point in case. Every top mixer on the planet, and I know most of them, either by their work or, or in person, they've all had one or two mixes rejected in favor of the rough mix. And that rough mix probably took the artist or the producer maybe 30 minutes to an hour to do, and you spent 12 hours on your mix and it got rejected in favor of the rough mix. It's happened to everybody. I think rather than get upset, let's ask ourselves, what was it about the rough that was created by a person with probably less skills than me makes it better. And when you answer that question, then, you'll, then you're really becoming a mix engineer because that's the essence of what we do. In other words, we, we sometimes have a tendency to, to focus on the technical things and nobody cares about that. They care about the, the energy and the vibe and the emotion. And that mix was done without thinking too much about the technical. It was just done by trying to get something done quickly. So again, this is amazing advice. I haven't actually watched this video before and definitely for more kind of intermediate mixes, like you absolutely need to watch this whole video. But the way that I think about this idea of, okay, sometimes the rough mix is better than the kind of the professional mix. Really that comes down to, again, what's right for the music. And it's really easy to get entrenched in the technical side of things. Say you just saw someone do a certain thing in a mix in a YouTube video and you're like, hey, I wanna try that. You're not leading with that intentionality. You're not doing what's right for the music. You're letting your ego get in the way and you're doing something for the sake of it or you're doing something technical. And it's kind of that idea of learn the rules so you can break them. You wanna be so good at the kind of objective technical stuff, the left brain stuff, that it becomes second nature. And then you almost want to forget it. And then when you're actually mixing, you want to be focused purely on the right brain kind of creative um, musical side. And you're not thinking about the technical stuff, you're purely just in the music. And a really good example of this is, okay, if you want to learn how to solo really well, whether that's on guitar or any instrument, you need to learn scales. But the goal is ultimately you learn the scales and they're subconscious, they're ingrained, they're muscle memory to the point where you can forget about them. And then when you're so Soloing, you're lost in the moment and all you're thinking about is the music and you kind of rid yourself of the shackles of the technical. That's the goal. And it's difficult because first you have to go through that phase of learning the technical. You have to learn the rules before you can break them. But a lot of people will stumble at that last hurdle, which is they learn the rules and then they become prisoned by them. Okay, so this next one, I definitely wish someone had told me a long time ago. Okay, this is interesting. So this is a great example where we're seeing two people say completely different things in one video, high pass everything. In this video, don't high pass everything. Again, the conclusion Conclusion you should take from that is it doesn't really matter. In order to get a tight and clear low end, you should always low cut anything that's not a bass sound. This is starting to become kind of funny. Almost every video talks about high pass filtering and says something completely different. No freaking way. And then this video, literally the first tip is high pass filtering. 6 dB per octave to 12 dB per octave slopes to avoid aggressive changes to the phase of these filters. Now let's take a listen to these filters being applied. Okay. Let's keep going. We'll come back to this at the end of the video because clearly this is something that's causing a lot of confusion. I used to start with just 
the drums like most people did and built up on it. And I found in time that the best thing to really do is to just throw it all up very quickly. I will spend the next 15 minutes all the way up to 45 minutes where I'll make quick balances and quick judgments without thinking about them and moving very quickly was just using my instinct. And as soon as I get to some place, I think it really sounds fairly good, which is generally will happen in 45 minutes. I immediately put a version of it down onto Pro Tools so that I remember my initial instinct. I also take a picture of the console at that point, and then I proceed. One of the unknowns for all of us is how the instinct and intellect work together. Your instinct has one place it goes and your intellect has another place it goes. So obviously in mixing and actually in anything artistic, if you have the ability to manage your instinct and intellect, where you can go between the two effortlessly, is when you'll find you'll make the best records. One of the dangers with modern mixing and modern record making is you absolutely have zero limits. The only thing that limits you is your creativity. Couple of thoughts. First of all, watching old videos like this is amazing because it kind of predates a lot of the, the YouTube stuff where people are just just kind of saying the same thing these memes kind of come about where everyone's just saying like high pass everything or you know never mixing solo all this kind of stuff we're going back to the source jack joseph huig amazing mixer he's talking about instinct versus intellect dave consado was talking about technical versus creative the fact that we're seeing that thread between dave consado jack joseph huig shows that there's something there and i'm going to expand on it a little bit more at the end of the video i think but just wanted to kind of draw some attention to that get the rough mix in there okay make sure you have all the parts put up all the faders get a quick balance of the song Get a balance that almost sounds like the song, okay? And then say, okay, where are the problems building here? Is it the drums that aren't cutting it? Is it okay, so here's Chris Lord Algae, Chris Lord Algae. I'm not actually sure how you meant to pronounce it. I've always said Chris Lord Algae. Talking about his workflow, and his workflow is basically get the volume only mix done. So get your faders up, like balance the track, get that sounding as good as possible, and then just start solving problems. So there is no top down mix bus first, or like I always do vocals. Like there's no hard and fast rules. It's actually just get the mix sounding good and then solve problems. So that alone is enough of a workflow, but really the common thread between all of these workflows is get the volume balance sounding awesome first and then either start by solving problems or you could start on the mix bus or you could start with the most important track like the vocals or a guitar depending on what it is. Uh, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Any of these would work. Video 100, let's do this. Let's find a good one to end with. Let's watch something from Sean Devine. The tonality so we're, we don't even know you know what's being said it's more of just something that's going to be uh, mixed in what you hear it with and without now you out here going wild i see you raging act like you don't know me now okay so this is a great example of using saturations to create those high frequencies uh instead of relying on eq and instead of using our bass in this situation like you might do on percussion uh sean's actually just hit shifting the vocal down an octave and that gives us like a lower version that gives it more kind of warmth so a great way of bringing out more low and more top end without relying just on eq because eq can only boost what's already there 100 videos done i'm very glad we're at the end of that that was more of a slog than i thought it'd be there was nine things though nine specific things that were very common and I think these are all really good tips so I want to cover those now number one is using references so if you're not doing that already you need to do it number two is taking lots of breaks really important number three is using automation and not keeping your mix too static and that's volume automation effects automation all of it number four is applying EQ and other processing to your aux channels your reverb channels your delay channels number five is get it right at the source in various versions of this whether it's get it right at the source in terms of recording or just like choosing the best samples, just focusing on production, basically not expecting mixing to do the heavy lifting. Number six is creating front to back depth. Number seven is at least checking in mono. Not everyone said mix in mono, but a lot of people said at least check in mono. And I agree, that's really good advice. Number eight, be intentional, have a reason, ask why you're doing something before you do it. Slow down, listen, find problems, then solve them. That alone is, is absolutely huge. And then number nine, parallel processing. A lot of people spoke about parallel processing. And honestly, it's not the thing that's going to take your mix from a 2 out of 10 to an 8 out of 10. It's a kind of small back pocket thing. I know plenty of mixers who don't do any parallel processing, uh, but it is a helpful technique nonetheless. Now, there was a ton of disagreement on high pass filtering. And I think I'm going to do a separate video on this. But in short, guys, it doesn't really matter. You don't need to high pass filter every single channel. Again, anytime someone prescribes something, do this all the time, or you need to do this, it's probably not true. There are some advantages for sure. You're going to clean out some of the low end in some of those channels that maybe do have some kind of residual low end in there that you wouldn't notice otherwise. But the risks, in my opinion, are bigger than the potential upside. You could see that it's just a safe approach to high pass everything. But the risk is if you high pass at too high a frequency or you high pass too 
too aggressively, you're gonna lose all the low end and you're gonna end up with a really thin sounding mix. When in doubt, just lead with problem solving. So if you go through the channels, and I recommend you do this before you start mixing, go through the channels one by one and just see if there's any kind of heavy kind of low end noise that needs removing. If it does, then use a high pass filter and kind of clean it up a bit. It's not a hard and fast rule. You don't need to high pass every single channel. Now, the thing that almost nobody spoke about and the people who did are people that I really admire and it tends to be the older, more experienced mixers like Dave Pensado, Jack Joseph Puig, Manny Marikin talks about this all the time. Is this difference between creative and technical is how Dave Pensado spoke about it. Intellect and intuition is how Jack Joseph Puig said it. And I've heard Manny Marikin speak before about left brain, right brain. And the language I use for this is objective, subjective. So not many people spoke about this. And the thing that nobody spoke about, literally not one person, was the interaction between those two things in the learning journey and which should you learn first or when should you learn creative versus technical? Can you learn creative without the technical? How do those two things interact? For the most part, people are kind of blending the two and they're not creating a clear distinction between them. But generally, you start with the more creative side because you're actually writing a track. First of all, you're writing a song and then you're trying to produce and you're trying to use tools creatively during the production process. So a lot of people start there, but then very quickly move into this kind of half subjective, half objective process. They're trying to be creative without a full mastery of the tools. And whenever I hear someone say, I have this sound in my head, but I can't actually get it to come out of the speakers correctly, straight away that just tells me that they don't actually have the technical understanding they need to turn their creative vision into a finished track. Now, the solution to all of this is to actually start with the objectives, to start with the technical, which may seem counterintuitive. But again, it's like learning music theory, or it's like learning scales. You need to learn the scales first. You need to get really, really good at the scales so that when you improvise, they're under your fingers, but they're also natural. You don't want to skip straight to improvising, and you also don't want to get stuck in technical land. So instead, what I actually recommend is doing the opposite of what most people do, which is starting with the objective, getting really, really comfortable with the technical side of the basic tools. Don't get distracted by more advanced tools too soon. Really nail EQ, compression, reverb, saturation, delay, the basic plugins at your disposal. Gain mastery over those things and also gain a really solid understanding of the science of audio production, which is frequencies, dynamics, and volume. Really, really grasp that and then forget about it. And a really easy way to do that is actually to start off learning mastering, which is the most technical part of the entire process. Then once you get really good at mastering, you can take what you've learned and apply it to mixing. But now you have the scientific language, you have the scientific knowledge and objective techniques that you need to actually get the sound you want. And when you think, okay, I want it to sound like this, you pull up a compressor and instead of wondering what all the parameters do or kind of getting pulled back into that technical world, you have mastery over it. So you can just be in a state of total creative flow as you're mixing. And then when you take that and apply it to producing, that's when it's a real game changer. You learn the rules, you broke them. You learn the scale and the theory, and now you can improvise. Now, even if you agree with this approach of learning the objective side first, and you want to drill down, you want to do that, and you want to start with mastering because it's the most objective part of the entire music production process. Well, the next problem you're going to have is that mastering can feel a bit like a dark art. It's really not. I don't know why people say that, but it's, it's actually pretty simple. You just have to have mastery over these tools. So if you want help with that, just click on the video that you see on screen now. It's our best mastering advice for beginners.